video will explore the white slaves of New Orleans. Children's photos were sold to raise money for freed slaves education in New Orleans during the mid 19th century. In the photographs, children demonstrated slavery was not solely a matter of color. This will be of no surprise to some viewers who are familiar with the trade of white slaves along the coasts of Africa, as well as the presence of white slavery as a crime in England until the 1950s, reflecting sex trafficking charges. In 1864, 12th Connecticut Infantry Colonel George H. Hanks and Philip Bacon brought the portraits of these emancipated slaves back from New Orleans, where General Butler set them free. Mr. Bacon went to New Orleans with the Army and worked for 18 months as Assistant Superintendent of Freedmen under the care of Colonel Hanks. Bacon's papers from 1862 to 1867 are held by the University of Michigan and reveal he was trying to run a Louisiana plantation seized by the Union Army during the latter half of the Civil War. As Bacon grew up in Connecticut, the lack of understanding of Louisiana soil would have been very difficult, and so he moved into an abolitionist fundraising role to raise money instead of pushing forward with agriculture himself. He leased his cotton and sugar cane plantations to others and died in Connecticut in 1910. Colonel Hanks was married before the war and was a resident of Hartford, Connecticut. I tried to find a photo of him and all I could find were pictures of Tom Hanks. In 1864, he joined Company H of the 12th Connecticut Volunteers. By mid-1862, the 12th Connecticut moved to the area around New Orleans and Hanks was stationed in the garrison of Camp Parapet, about 10 miles north of the city. He was also detailed as aide-de-camp of Brigadier General Sherman for the superintendents of contrabands, slaves who had escaped and joined Union lines. He organized six colonies at Camp Parapet, each led by a non-commissioned officer, and directed black workers in the repair and fortification of the camp and its surroundings. In 1863, he was mustered out of the 12th Connecticut and appointed superintendent of a new agency, the Bureau of Negro Labor. In this role, he supervised labor on numerous plantations that had been seized by the Union Army as Union leadership wanted to produce cotton for sale and use. Slavery did not end under Union leadership, which is a common misconception in America today. The federal government was eager to use the resources of the South. In the area it occupied, the Union Army in Louisiana had declared the Emancipation Proclamation and freed slaves came to its camps to be put to work for the American federal government under Lincoln. Hanks' sympathy for blacks in the department occasionally put him at odds with department commander General Nathaniel Banks, who struggled to balance the needs of the ex-slaves with the legal claims of Louisiana planters for his command. Hanks strongly advocated for the openings of schools for young blacks, which had been in existence in Philadelphia and Baltimore and together with Thomas W. Conway, organized a system of freedmen schools in New Orleans. These schools, dedicated to blacks only, began opening in the fall of 1863. On August 27, 1863, Hanks was appointed by Major General Nathaniel Banks, along with Colonel John Clark and Major B. Bush Plumley, to a commission to regulate the enrollment, recruitment, employment, and education of blacks in the Department of the Gulf of which Banks was the senior commander. In this way, New Orleans swelled to 58% black in 1840 and has remained steady at that percentage for over a hundred years. Harper's Weekly published the following article on January 30th, 1864. The article provided a rare record of enslaved children in the United States. Hanks was eager to use the media to raise funding for his mission. He took eight former slaves on tour with him, five of them children, and four of these appearing to be white. He took the group to photo studios to have visiting cards printed, which he sold to raise money for the schools. Photographer Myron Kimball took photos of the former slaves, one of which was published as a woodcut in Harper's Weekly. The American Missionary Association and the National Freedmen's Relief Association both added their support and sponsorship to the tour helping make arrangements for the movement of children across state lines without their parents, which was illegal and is illegal. In April 1864, Hanks returned to New Orleans, where he was superintendent of Negro labor. 
He was very interested in freeing the children of emancipated slaves who were still being held by their parents, their relatives, or their parents' former owners. New Orleans in the 1860s relied on naval commerce and not hotels, gambling, drinking, and prostitution as it does today. Coming and going from the forests of Louisiana were beef, pork, lard, buffalo robes, beer hides, bear hides, deer skins, lumber, lime, tobacco, flour, and corn. It was the cotton bales and hogshead of sugar stacked high on the levee that really made the New Orleans economy hum. Cotton exports from New Orleans increased more than sevenfold in the 1820s. Pouring down the continental funnel of the Mississippi Valley to its base, cotton amounted by the end of the decade to more than 180 million pounds, which was more than half the cotton produced in the entire country. Nearly all of Louisiana's sugar left the state through New Orleans to be refined, and the holds of more and more ships filled with it as the number of sugar plantations tripled in the second half of the 1820s. Sugar refineries would be established in the South throughout the 1800s, generating jobs and revenue that was previously sent abroad. Legally, slavery ended in the United States in 1808, before the Civil War. In 1808, Congress exercised its constitutional prerogative to end the legal importation of enslaved people from outside the United States. But it did not end domestic slave trading, leaving this up to the states, creating a federally protected internal market for human beings, much like today when ICE gets defunded and so cannot investigate trafficking claims or cities declare themselves sanctuary cities. Slavery is acceptable under several religions, including Judaism and Islam, and so abolitionist movements started in American Christians, such as Quakers. According to the Jewish Virtual Library, other slaves were always recruited from other nations. Hebrews themselves can only become slaves voluntarily. That is, a distinction is made between the nations. In the Chabad, slaves must rest on the seventh day and Jewish holidays and are obligated in mitzvah and so are considered indentured servants rather than slaves. This contrasts to Christianity, where Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, and this is referred to as slavery in Genesis 37. There is no splitting of hairs. So we see the richest slavers in New Orleans were often Jewish, like Isaac Franklin. As Franklin stood in New Orleans awaiting the arrival of the United States cargo ship filled with enslaved people sent from Virginia by his business partner, John Armfield, he aimed to get his share of the entire nationwide slavery business. Franklin and Armfield would become the largest slaveholding group in the United States, generating billions of dollars for themselves. You can also see in images from the time well-dressed blacks standing in New Orleans ports, and these were often African traders who coordinated the sale of warring tribes or losing tribes prior to 1808 in Angola and elsewhere, and then remained in the business for decades. There were also American blacks who owned slaves, such as Antoine Dubuclé, who owned over a hundred slaves for his sugar plantation close to Baton Rouge, which was one of the biggest in Louisiana by 1860. Dubuclé is very interesting because he was elected Louisiana State Treasurer in 1868 by both white and black voters. He won and then cleared Louisiana's debt after the Civil War. He is buried in New Orleans. So we see black slaveholders in American office in the 1800s, elected by the people. Turning to the children who appeared in these photographs. The 11-year-old Rebecca Huger worked as a slave in her father's house as the special attendant to a girl a little older than her. She appears to be white. There is no trace of another race in her complexion, hair, or features. During the first few months she has been in school, she has learned to read well, and she writes as neatly as most children her age. Her mother and grandmother live in New Orleans, where they support themselves comfortably through their own labor. The grandmother told Mr. Bacon that she had raised many children, but these are all that are left to her. Rebecca was owned by her father, John M. Huger, who held 17 house slaves. Huger, as her father, wanted to keep Rebecca in the household with him and was concerned about emancipation, but Rebecca ended up on this national tour with Bacon and then disappears from the record entirely. Rosina Downs was not quite seven years old. She was a fair child with blonde complexion and silky hair. Her father was a confederate. 
She had one sister who was as white as her and three brothers who were darker. Her mother lived in a poor hut in New Orleans and worked hard to support her family. Again, I can find no record of Rosa Downs or Rosina Downs after this nationwide tour. Some scholars have suggested that these children changed their names, but I don't know. Charles Taylor was eight years old. He was twice sold as a slave with his mother, first by his father and owner, Alexander Weathers or Withers of Lewis County, Virginia to a slave trader named Harrison, who sold them to Mr. Thornhill of New Orleans. Weathers was called the largest slave owner in Lewis County by owning up to 12 slaves, several of which were his children by his slave, Lucy Taylor. Weathers was a teacher to Stonewall Jackson in 1839, but he was also a delegate to the Union's freewheeling convention of May 1861. As he got older, he realized he could not manage his estate, and so he sold Lucy Taylor and her two children in 1864, a year before he died. His son, Charles Taylor, was decidedly intelligent, and though he had been at school less than a year, he reads and writes very well. According to Harper's Weekly, Lucy Taylor had a daughter sold into Texas before she herself left Virginia and one son who she supposes is with his father in Virginia. This contrasts the record that Weathers sold uh, two children in 1864. Charles Taylor's complexion was very fair, his hair light and silky. Three out of five boys in any school in New York are darker than he. Slave trader Harrison fled, slave trader Harrison fled at the approach of the Union Army, and all of his slaves were liberated by General Butler. These three children, Rebecca, Rosa, and Charles, to all appearances of the unmixed white race came to Philadelphia and were taken by their protector, Mr. Bacon, to the St. Lawrence Hotel on Chestnut Street. Within a few hours, Mr. Bacon informed Harper's Weekly was notified by the landlord that they were colored and that he only kept a hotel for white people. The children were then taken to the Continental Hotel in Philadelphia where they were received without hesitation. It was up to business owners how they uh, wanted to accept different guests at the time. The editor of Harper's Weekly said this with the photos. Slavery permits slaveholding gentlemen to seduce the most friendless and defenseless of women. So here was a race mixing argument against slavery, which hadn't really taken root before. Like I said, I have tried to find evidence of these children after their nationwide tour and could not find it. It's possible that they were packed up to Bacon's plantations in Louisiana. Who knows what happened to them, but the abolitionists raised a lot of money by their likenesses that were funneled to the schools in New Orleans. Each photograph was sold, large ones for $1 and small ones for $0.25, cents, with the proceeds donated to the Freedmen schools. Of this series, about 22 prints are still in existence and are held by the Library of Congress.